Welcome to the Whiskey and Wisdom Podcast, coming to you from the Cargo District Recording Studios in Wilmington, North Carolina, where we discuss the most fascinating topics of life. I'm Tyler Yaw with my co-host, Chris Kelly, and each week we interview a special guest to learn how they acquired their wisdom over a glass of whiskey. So sit back, pour yourself a glass, and enjoy Whiskey and Wisdom. I do believe sometimes the universe will just put something in my face so many times I can't ignore it. Two weeks ago, one of my friends from Raleigh reached out and said, Natalie, you told me that you want to be your best version of yourself and CrossFit at Porter's (laughs) Neck on Market Street's having a great sale. And I would love to give that to you as a gift. And I'm laughing because, like, I had a really good reason not to do it the first time Mm -hmm. because I live in Carolina Beach and it's so far. But daggone, the universe just keeps putting it in my face. I think there's a better version of me coming, y'all, that's more fit and more attuned with not eating so many fried foods. (laughs) I'm sure it's a central CrossFit then, right? Does that sound right? Yes. That's it's. I love it there because when people think CrossFit, they think like a bunch of meatheads just throwing like (laughs) tires. Yes. And it's, it's not that like, so they they do focus on a lot of the strength training process because that's what CrossFit is. But everyone there just Normal human beings like yes. anyone else. There was a woman there that was, how old was she? 58, something like that. That is amazing. He was I, over there doing like muscle ups, like incredible dang. things. So I'm like, dang, if I'm like that when I'm that age, like I would call that success. That is super <laughs> inspirational. Wow. I was just thinking of how much I've abused my body. Mm. Like I went skiing for the first time and all my friends were like, let's go down the black diamond. And I was like, why not? And then I tore my ACL, you know? Oh, yeah. And, and then like one time I went out and I was like, I can go play tennis after not playing for 20 years. Cause I'm good at it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I was good at it 20 years ago and I like tore my shoulder up. And so I'm just, you know, I'm going to have to have some adaptation and a very patient trainer, but Let's do it, man. Yeah. Let's yeah, do something, definitely. right? Well, now that we're going there too, we'll we'll see you over at Essential. We'll if you see. Sign up. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> That's a heck of a drive. We're gonna have to work on that. But I mean, we'll... there are. I live in Leland, so I understand. Do you really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow, so, that is a commitment. That's telling, actually, that yeah. you're willing to go that far. You're talking about elements in a gym that I'm bringing to my company. Yeah. And it's that encouragement, right? Like if you ask someone to do something hard. You have to encourage them and give them guidance. And and you just said, you know, help them make sure the the muscles are working in the right way. And I think that's what good leaders do in any type of business. And and we're doing it with Ohanify, which I think is magical because we're sitting here talking about a gym. So Mm -hmm. that's awesome. I used to run. I've run a 15K. Please don't Google my time. It's so terrible, y'all. I didn't think I was going to make it. And I had my phone ready to dial up an Uber. Like it was so dreadfully terrible there there were just an immeasurable amount and the only thing I could do is say you know my daddy told me one time I can do anything actually he told me that all my life and the only thing that I could really do is just muster up like you can do anything and I promise you if you ever get across that finish line you will never sign up for this again <laughs> and that's exactly what's happened so I probably need to give myself a little grace and at least yeah. try to move more you know that's the goal right just to exactly just get hope for a little more health because as we age that stuff becomes important and yeah. you want mobility and you want to be able to do go do the crazy things mm-hmm before we get too much in the meat and potatoes here, Chris, what are we drinking and open the open the show? That's a great question. This week we're well, I could probably tell topic. you mostly about this. This is one of my favorite. All right. So funny enough, this week I just grabbed the bottle from the liquor store and I saw this and I'm like, I've seen this before and it just looks good. And I saw it in like one of those TikToks where it's like, oh, do this as like a freezer old fashioned. Oh yeah. But we grabbed it. It's rabbit hole boxer grill. Mm. So it's their rye iteration. What's the fancy word that they call it? Offering. There you oh, go. Oh, okay. It's the rye <laughs> yeah, offering. I have no clue. So it's ninety five percent rye, five percent malted barley. Uh-huh. It's supposed to have like your traditional spice, brown sugar, butterscotch. Mm-hmm. But I think what's gonna be my just spot is a palette it's supposed to be citrus, floral notes, and it's supposed to be herbaceous. Had to bring that word back. Chris loves um, that word. And it's supposed to have like black tea and sweet spice. And I am a lover of tea and citrus. So I'm interested to see what this kind of tastes like. 
That's what I love about this one. So it just a, sounds like love in a bottle. Oh, there's That's so what I many different. Would you like some? Yes, I would. I would love to try it. Thank you. Citrus is comforting. There's something about citrus that just feels like home and that's perfect. Thank you. So rye is one of my favorite because it has a spiciness to it, but this one is a little bit sweeter because of like the citrus that's in it and some of the floral nodes and the, you said butterscotch. That's typically what I taste when I drink this, not as much as citrus, but the butterscotch and tea flavor, I definitely get out of it. All right. Well, I'm going to teach y'all something here for a second. And that's because my good friend Franklin at Tarbar Brewing Company says you got to get your nose in it. Yeah. Mm, That smells so good. It really does. I think I taste the herbaceousness. Yeah. It's if it has a lot of flavors coming through, mm-hmm. which is weird tasting these flavors over top of the smash burger. I just had <laughs> yeah. like, and having something that like can actually go over top of just like a combination of like greasy burger, but mm-hmm. still have enough palate to just like, Hmm, can you taste all of these things? I can't believe you ate a smash burger before a liquor tasting. Um, <laughs> I needed something. I understand. Absorption. Yes. Yeah. We have four of these today. So. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's always it fun. Amazing. But as you guys know, we, we like to mix things up every once in a while. You get your boy Chris Tyler here and introducing someone I have quite literally just met like 15 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> Please introduce yourself, man. Hey, my name is Natalie Waggett. I've been in Wilmington for a good period of time since 93 when I came down here and worked as a bank teller during the summer before my freshman year at UNCW. Nice. Oh, wow. And I am currently the chief executive officer of a software company here in town called Ohanify, and we are seeking to transform the craft beverage industry by giving them technology and love and support to help them make their businesses do more of what their businesses do, which is magic. And they change communities and they provide jobs and they give people a safe place to go. And they bring all these people with these common interests together. And they give you an opportunity to be around your friends and listen to good music and just let your creative energies flow. And I think coming out of COVID, Everybody is craving more of that, more of the opportunity to sit with friends at bars and have conversations that are meaningful where you can grow and learn. And it's it's the industry that we as co-founders came across first that inspired us. And we don't know where we end because we are so ambitious and we are so full of love for any any business opportunities that can help us to continue to support community and people helping each other, we believe sky's the limit. We're seven months in. We've got 14 customers. We've already crossed over several sub-verticals that we didn't plan on being in for a really long time. We're getting interest from national brands. We chose the right platform with Salesforce. Mm -hmm. I learned that during my last 15 years that I spent in consulting and looking at business technology and business problems. And I worked for a company here in town called Encino, number mm-hmm, mm-hmm. employee number 13 there, and oh, wow. got to watch that place grow and expand and do the right things and help take care of customers and grow employees. And it inspired me to want to do my part in helping to make the world a better place. And we settled first in craft beverage, and we are having the time of our lives doing it. I'm glad you bring that up, too, because I think the just kind of the alcohol industry in general gets a really bad rap. Because you think about going downtown when you're a sophomore in college and people are just getting drunk and stuff. But when you get to, um, I guess when you get out of college, (laughs) right, is when you really start to appreciate going out and the community that's built around a a good craft beverage. Especially a lot of these craft breweries that we have around here as well, too. Mm -hmm. You get together, like you said, listen to some music that you like. You might get someone from one walk of life meeting another person from a completely different area they never would have come into contact with before. And you have a conversation and that's really how this podcast was brought together too, is from bar conversations of people you never meet before. It's so beautiful. I love that we can grow together as humans and I have just found so much magic in this industry and I've found a a lack of attention because honestly their margins are slim. It's hard to, it's hard to make money in, in supporting small business sometimes for those of us with big dreams and billion dollar 
dreams and goals in our head, but but what we have fundamentally come to realize is we're better together. And so if we can support small business, we know that small business can support us. And as we have to move up market, we're learning from even the larger players that the functionality we've built resonates with them. So what that tells me is I'm setting any small business owner up to to grow, right? right. And when we started the company, we said, let's have one qualifying question because we have to think about process and mm-hmm. how to how to, you know, help people understand what we do. And the and the question was, do you want to grow? Yeah. Because if you do, you're gonna reach a critical mass. And and I think if there's one thing about my co founders and I that I, and even all, every employee we have at the company looks at it as, is this scalable? Is it sustainable? We don't want to just make someone happy today. We want to make them happy for our, the duration of our relationship. Right. And I, I love that I'm surrounded with people who believe that way and who see the power of combining together and linking arms with our customers and not perceiving them as a contract, but as a relationship. They're another link in the chain. And that gives us so much power to be able to go out together and do these amazing, extraordinary things. So we're excited about what we're doing. I don't know if you can tell I'm a little passionate. Right. (laughs) Uh, What got you interested in starting in this? So you were over at Encino for 15 years. What was the catalyst that said, you know what, this is, this is the move I need to make. It is the amalgamation of a thousand of those things that have all added up to just being exactly where, when you know you're exactly where you're supposed to be doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, it's the greatest gift. And it starts with a layoff. And everyone right now is talking about layoffs and how sad they are. And I worked for Bank of America for 18 years. I was a commercial banker, business banker, wealth advisor. I was a branch manager. I was a teller and I was a personal banker. I did a lot in that. And I think that's what big companies do for people like me. They give us the opportunity to go and dabble in other areas and figure out what we really are called to do. Mm-hmm. In my last role in 2008, we all know what happened. I was a, a wealth advisor dealing with high net worth clients and, and and entire divisions of our organization got shut down. And it was just based on what was going on in the market. And it was scary, right? There was a lot of stuff happening in 2008. And after that layoff, I spent some time working with my husband, who he and I were blissfully married for 19 and a half years. And and together, we ran many businesses. We ran a snow cone concession trailer, a commercial and residential construction company, Mm -hmm. a residential rehab company. He was a realtor for a while, so we had a realty, a wholesale and retail seafood market, an auto detail shop, and one of my personal favorites, a retail casket store. He was the dreamer. He was the dreamer. And I was the one who made stuff operationally sound, right? So, like, Mm -hmm. we know early on that that's one of my gifts. And so, in gosh, about six years ago, almost to the day, that just caught my attention. But he passed away. And that's a hard thing to go through. I had, after leaving banking, one of my clients recruited me. I went into Encino. I was a business development rep. I helped support marketing I helped support sales. I ended up running all of global pre-sales. I think when I left, I had 65 employees. It wow. was it was an amazing, amazing ride. Mm-hmm. And after I lost my husband, I was tired and I needed a, I needed to change everything because you just don't know what you are going to need until you go through that situation. And in my case, I had to shift everything in my reality. And I tried with silly stuff like parking in the back instead of parking in the front or not wearing a shirt and a pair of pants together because it helped me kind of, you know, reshift my habits and, and all of that stuff about me. But we ended up moving. My son and I moved for a little bit of time down to Little River, South Carolina, mm-hmm. and we were welcomed there with open arms and It was just an amazing experience. As part of that, I changed my career as well, went into consulting because I thought, "Mm, let me just go help people solve some problems and figure out what problems really need solved. And then we'll figure it out. I was kind of tired of speaking banking, but banking was the vocation. It was the knowledge and the tools in my toolbox that got me into Encino. And I will always, of course, be grateful for that. When we when I went into consulting, I knew it was going to be short term and I knew I wanted to go into a really big company because I wanted to see the processes. Like I wanted to see how a big company would orchestrate stuff. And I learned so much about business process development and I got to sit and talk with live customers all the time about their problems. But at some point becomes a little bit of a conflicting business model 
where you're trying more to get billable hours than you are to actually solve problems. And that is mm-hmm. frustrating for, for people who just want to fix problems. So mm-hmm. I had an idea that a product company was in my future. I just didn't yet know what industry I really wanted to focus on and help. And there were people that got, you know, just peppered into my career, these amazing, extraordinary people. And I would always make mental note, like, one day, one day, that that person's going to be with me and we're going to do something amazing. And I think as leaders, it's really important for us to always be looking out for those kinds of people, people that have a heart for community like y'all, which I'm Thanks. already thinking in my head, how do we how do we get to do more fun stuff with you guys? But when you find those special people and you realize that they all have these extraordinary skill sets that put them into buckets sometimes like, oh, we're looking for developers or, oh, we're looking for people that can configure this or build on this. And so we have said from the beginning, we hire the heart and we train the skill because we know that we can train the skill. And we've ended up with some of the most extraordinary people in the company that are, I, I just sit in awe every day that everybody in, on our team is someone that I am so proud and thrilled to work with. And so Ohanify, you know, is, is love when you think about it in terms of what we are. I mean, we're delivering love through software and technology because that's what we know. And we're delivering it through better business process. But from the beginning, we set out to create this company that would help make our customers money because we think software should be able to do that right. and save them money because we think that it ought to be able to do that too and save them time. And and that, those were the benefits that I learned as a banker back in 1994 as I was going through sales training classes with Bank of America that if you build something that people will value and treat them right, mm-hmm. and and that's big to us because our, our customers in particular, this industry has had such a huge boom. I mean, there were not 10,000 breweries five years ago. And to think about the growth in a nation, and it's because everybody sees all this magic that happens when they go in and this sense of community. And I promise y'all, most of them are not in it for the money. They're in it for how great it feels to be able to help and support a community. Mm -hmm. And so I got reacquainted with that, or actually I got introduced to it because a good friend of mine, Inez Ribostello out of Tarboro, North Carolina, had written a book about her experience as first the beverage manager of Windows of the World. And how September 11, 2001, that world of hers came crumbling down. And I, I read her book on the way home from dropping my son off for what would be his first combat deployment in the U.S. Army. Wow. Talk about making you put your big girl's panties on fast. Mm-hmm. That, that will make you trust in everything because you don't have any other choice. <clears throat> Sorry. I read Inez's book, and I was so inspired by it. I actually listened to it on the way home on that trip, and I was so inspired by it. I reached out to her, and I said, look, wow, like I want to help. How can I help you? You're so extraordinary to be that vulnerable and that authentic in a book. I mean, there's hilarious stories in this book. And at the end of our dinner where we were just brainstorming on ways that we could help each other, ways that we could help each other and lift each other up and be supportive of each other in this really authentic way, and, of course, the brewery comes up, and she owns a brewery there in Tarboro. And, and I can remember her getting a little teary-eyed, and I could tell that she had lost her. Not completely lost it. She was clinging on to it by a thread. But I thought, this is how I can help her. Like Because what she's done is so amazing and so extraordinary. All we have to do is let people know that, you know? So we partnered up, and I went, and I rode along with her, and I watched her use her technology, and I helped her tote kegs into restaurants, and I got to meet (laughs) restaurant owners who, you know, I asked crazy questions like, why do you choose your beers, and how do you buy, and, tell you know, I talked to grocery store managers, like, what does it take for for these folks to to get in with you, And, Mm -hmm. and it was all about service, every response I got from anyone that I asked who ultimately becomes a craft beverage manufacturer's customer, it was all about service, taking care of the customer, turning out the best product, giving them the best margin, and helping them know how to how to use that beer to increase their profitability. It was just about service and, and t- touching people, but not just obligation, like stopping by and cleaning mm. the lines. They don't like it when you clean the lines because you pour out beer. <laughs> right. Like, don't clean the lines so much, you know, yeah. just... 
little stuff like that. And I start, I, you know, I partnered up with my friend Ian Padrick and Chris Dowling and Davis Bryson and Matt Keeter. And these are all just extraordinary guys that have so much knowledge about Salesforce as a platform. Mm. And we knew Salesforce because of Encino and because of other pursuits. And because when I consulted, we we all have consulted on Salesforce. And so it was just this magical platform. And that that's another company that has aspired to inspire. Mm-hmm. And they've done that by creating a platform where so many can learn it, can create new job applications for it, can create new careers for themselves. I mean, I'm a banker turned technologist, not because I learned how to write code, but because I learned Salesforce. And it's a beautiful platform. So I feel like I'm rambling. I want y'all to talk some. (laughs) So actually, I had a question. I think you kind of touched on why, but I just want to hear it from you and your words. Is that why you named your company Ohanify? My company was already named Ohanify when I showed up at the door with this idea. Mm -hmm. Because the universe loves to give me tangible proof. Ian Patrick had started up a Salesforce consultancy, and he knew that one day they wanted a product. They just didn't have a product. They had been open for two weeks. Oh, wow. At a common desk area in downtown Wilmington. And I rolled in, and with an hour, I could see his wheels turning. And I gave him my most impassioned pitch because at this point, I had decided, okay, I've ridden along with her. I've seen people's reactions to the beer. I know that the wholesale expectations are just good service. And I know that she, more than anybody in the world, is capable of delivering that at Mm -hmm. scale. And so... When I went in, my pitch was, we can help this industry. We can make a difference in the world, and this is how we can do it. And it's going to be – it's it's not going to be glamorous in the sense of, like, high-dollar value contracts, but we can build the skill and the materials and the process that we need to be able to support this and to be able to add so much value to these business owners that it is a partnership, We can be really vulnerable and we can tell them it's not going to be perfect. We've only been working on it seven months, Mm -hmm. but what we've given is so extraordinary. And, and we go to, we talk to our customers and we say things like you have to give us feedback because if it's hard for you, it's hard for everyone. And we're really vulnerable enough to receive that feedback and we measure it, which I think is magical because we know that we've gotten since we've started taking customers live And by the way, having 14 contracts is astounding and it's extraordinary in seven months. Yeah. But when I tell you we have eight live customers Mm -hmm. using it, that is extraordinary because this is effectively a tier one solution. Mm -hmm. This is what they use to operate their business. Like it, it cannot not work. There is a whole nother level of responsibility when you're delivering something like this. And from those eight customers, we've gotten 60 or 65, I think, at last count, pieces of feedback that are like, this is making my job really hard. Fix it. And I think at last measurement of that, 95% of that we're including in our next release because it's that easy for us to listen. Sometimes we just forget to ask, you know? Interesting. Sorry, my (laughs) head. I go back. I was listening to a thing the other day. So... When talking about asking people for evaluation to like figure out what to adjust and fix to help things, Chris's random wave path, how do you like, do you ask people to rate you like one through five or are you like a one through 10 kind of person or are you just like short answer? We look for, well, we want to be able to do it publicly. Okay. And so we have to give them scales that are normalized, which is generally Google and Captera and G2 reviews Mm -hmm. and places like that. Now, on the inside, we also ask them from a product feedback perspective where we ask them to do things like rate it like and we're drinking a little liquor so I can be more crass than normal. Uh I hope. But one (laughs) is like this is a minor nuisance. And five is like I might burn down the building if you all don't get this fixed. Right. Because (laughs) we have to have a way to hear this stuff. And put it into terms that everybody understands. And and our customers understand that, right? And, and, and at some point, when we get more and more customers, we'll prioritize based on the way that we're asking them now to kind of talk to us about mm-hmm. how and how how influential this decision is because we don't want anybody burning down any buildings, no, right? Yeah. And, and that type of feedback, that type of model will scale. Yeah. And we'll have the ability to help more and more people and learn from others because if we're not learning we're dying and 
to have an entire industry committed to making something better. That's where I go back to linking arms with our customers. It's not a contract. It's not a, oh, 36 months or 12. What This is linking arms with people that believe in what you're doing. And we've, I mean, I can, I can name names of people who didn't get to see anything. And they said, yes, we believe in y'all. I was watching Jerry Maguire the other day. Have yeah. y'all seen that lately? Yeah, lately? No, it's been a few years. You should rewatch it. It's amazing. I'm so inspired by the theme of it, which is, wow, just to have people get to grow together and learn together and create exactly what they want together. I want to be a software company that can deliver the kind of service that I'm talking about. Now, we got to figure out how to scale it, and we got to figure out how to make all the the metrics work, right? Because that's how we are judged as a software company. And so... To be able to balance all of that and do it with such extraordinary people, I, I just can't wait to see what we do. I love that. So the reason why I asked that, I was listening to I listened to the Randomness podcast. I was listening to Waveform, and they went on a rant about like the rating systems that everyone has, and we're at the point now where everyone is either one or five, and I'm like. I'm one of those people I'd rather give you a four or a three because that that's an actual measurement of what's going on. And so I didn't know like if you perceived one and five as like super drastic or if you actually are one of those people who are like, I would prefer an actual rating because yours is kind of reverse of what I normally think. So like if it's a two or a three, we know, Hey, there's an issue, but we need, this needs to be fixed in this time frame. Whereas if it's a five, it needs to get done now. That's so funny. I've never thought about that before. When I think about prioritization, because that's different than delight, right? In delight, Mm -hmm. we want the higher number. But in prioritization, the higher number is always the house is on fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, red or blue or green or whatever the colors you might want, red, yellow, green. But we, we want to define two, three, and four. We're actually asking customers right now to help us with that because we don't want just ones and fives. Yeah. And and we need to know that if something really is a five, that's something we need to know about immediately. So we don't anticipate getting many of those yeah. because that's pretty drastic. But those are the ones that would obviously get the highest amount of attention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you would need, because you're always updating software and doing updates and whatnot, that it makes sense that if they're only giving you ones, you're like, okay, well, this is fine. I don't need to do very many updates. But if it's a four, well... That's pretty bad. We yeah. That's why Google reviews are such horrible. horrible because you only have either. I learned this one at UNCW is you have your apostles that are giving you and we're like that five on Google reviews, or you have your terrorists that are giving you a one. Yes. Yeah. And there's and really where the value lies is the two threes and fours. Yeah. Agreed, because you want the feedback from the twos, threes, and fours, and so we're just more actively soliciting that feedback even without the public reviews. Right. And that's what I think is so to, to be able to already seven months in have a mechanism to take product feedback and implement it in at rapid scale is magical. And I think when software companies lose sight of our ability to do that really quickly, it can, it can hurt them. I think that is something that you, that's important that you're touching on too, because I know about quite a few different technology and software companies that I have friends that work for. And one of their largest complaints is the disconnect between customer and product. Yes. And what you're talking about is that complete connection of it. Yeah. So actually hearing about that, and especially in a Salesforce world, one of my best friends actually left a very well paying consulting because of that disconnect. And what you were saying too, they were all concerned about those billable hours and not about the solution that they were supposed to be providing for that client. So what you said, it completely connects. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And I I think that as technologists, we've been given the keys to immeasurable amounts of tools and data and knowledge and insight and guidance that we can provide to business owners. And I know a lot of people say they left corporate America to go to brewing, to go to brewing. Mm-hmm. We've heard that, right? I don't, I don't need all this structure. I, I just came from corporate America. Yeah. And, and it's traumatic because in corporate America, look, I went through four different CRM, customer relationship management platforms during my tenure at Bank of America. And I hated every single mm-hmm. one of them because none of them added value to me. Like, right. show me what my customers have. And, and we've taken that same philosophy 
with brewing, and that is that we want them to be able to see where their customers have purchased and what those patterns are. We want them to be able to visualize that data. And and in banking, we got to a point where data was so siloed because, oh, it's too much risk to put it all together. But the whole together is the person, right? Mm-hmm. That's the relationship that you need to ultimately manage. So as a relationship manager, you know this. If you don't know where their mortgages are and you don't know where their other assets are and you don't know how they're diversified in that portfolio that you've never laid eyes on, how in the world can you give them mm-hmm. in, in, guidance? And, and so – Now I look at that and I look back on that experience and I'm really grateful for it because it's given me the opportunity to see that data is really and truly, especially for a small business owner or a business owner of, you know, mid and even large cap companies. It's the most important component that they can put in front of their employees because in order for any employee to be able to properly service a customer, they need to know who they are. And we built that as a component of, you know, inventory and production. We know they got to produce stuff. And that's actually the easy part for us because it's math. Like you buy something, you check it in at whatever you paid for it. And now that's your purchase price. And and you take all that stuff you bought and you mix it together in equipment. And that equipment's really expensive. So you got to be able to take care of it. You got to be able to maintain it and service it and keep track of warranties and serial numbers. And then once it comes out of that equipment, it's a finished good, right? It's something that you've produced that you now want to market and sell. And most product, most products and ERP solutions stop once the finished good is packaged. Well, now I just have a cooler of finished goods. What am I supposed to do with it? And so we take it like four steps further with like sales and marketing. And what about the people that work for you? I'm doing a an article right now with Beth Clare, and, and it's about – human resources and human capital and what it means to have human beings that wake up and go to sleep every night thinking about what you're doing and what you're delivering and just having the ability to get to influence people in such a positive way, especially in rural areas where there aren't many jobs and those jobs are so special. And so to be able to influence people and give them feedback and give them performance reviews and coach them up and tell them where they're not meeting your expectations because that's the best gift, right? That lets everybody off the hook. If, and if that's not something they want to do, then there are a lot of other opportunities out there, but get and attract and retain the people that are going to make the greatest impact to your ultimate mission. And that is, you know, driving revenue and being more of whatever it is that you're seeking to be a community hub a place where people can go on Sundays and sing beer and hymns. Like how beautiful is that? (laughs) So I love, I love what we're doing. And I think it's, it's magical to get to take the skills that we acquire in these big companies Mm -hmm. and apply them in really tactical ways to help people change the way they're going to market and doing business. So for everyone who's listening that doesn't completely know what Ohanify is, it's kind of a start to finish system for it's mostly craft breweries right now, right? We started out in craft brewery. Yeah. And I'm sorry if I'm leaving it ambivalent. Yeah. We have created on Salesforce, the world's greatest platform, craft beverage management solution. We started out in breweries Quickly moved to distilleries with our friend Shane down the street here yeah. at end of days. Mm-hmm. And I like your earrings, by the way. Thank you. I, <laughs> I try to represent. And and we just, we believe that small business owners deserve the same type of technology that we've all had our hands in in big corporate or global organizations. So we built sales, marketing, production, inventory, human capital, people, forms, gen, all kinds of different features to, to help our customers in that market make money, save money, and save time. And the customers who are using it are loving it. Nice. Something that I'm going to start asking a lot of people that come on to the podcast, I did it in the last episode, so I want to ask you as well. A lot of entrepreneurs and business owners like to let everyone know what value that they have for them. So to take that and flip it, I got this from Catherine Bruner, who's been on the podcast a few times. What's something that the community can do to help you? Oh, that's so nice. Thank you for asking. I think it's continuing to help us get our brand out. The community has been so gracious. Folks like Jim Roberts at the Network for Entrepreneurs Wilmington has pointed us in so many amazing directions. I mean, he's been such an advocate. So the community should support folks like that, that have the power and the knowledge and the bandwidth and the people network to be able to help us get the word out. You know, I think you can support craft beverage manufacturers because as they drive revenue, 
as they grow, we grow. And right. and that's our premise. So, you know, I, I get excited about what we can do as a community for each other, especially in times when when we're going through difficulties. And even as companies get bigger, let's not forget what they did for our community. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's so easy right now to to kick in Sino based on these recent layoffs. But in reality, guys, like they they've helped craft an entire community around software development and Salesforce, and they have attracted some of the most extraordinary people that I've ever met to this community who want to stay here and continue to invest in the community. So I think it's about us giving each other grace and support and and joining up with and linking arms with others who feel and are passionate about doing the same like you guys, right, and getting those stories out there. I love that too. It actually reminds me when I was visiting St. Louis a couple of years ago. And of course, St. Louis is the place where Budweiser was created. And most of us sitting here in Wilmington, North Carolina today, think about Budweiser's massive brand that was bought by an international company. And they're like, ah, whatever this company. But in St. Louis, they drink Budweiser like water and they support (laughs) Budweiser as if it was that small local company. It was a hundred years ago. And that, that actually kind of spoke to me too, because when I first went there and the only thing on tap was Budweiser products, I'm like, come on now guys. (laughs) But then when you actually sit down and think about it, it's like, you know what, if Wilmington Brewing Company or Wrightsville or New Anthem blew up like that, I would still be sitting at their bar drinking all their products now too. So yes. that, that, that means a lot. So I, I think you that. bring that up. No, I love that. I mean, imagine going to Chapel Hill and everything being painted NC state red, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Like that's why I wear earrings for yeah. end of days. Like I want, I want to support our local folks. They're yeah, special yeah. and they're, they're doing it all day, every day. They're investing in this community and they are giving back. And how can we not want to support that? Absolutely. It always throws me off. Cause like, so many people are like, oh, you know, let's support local. And then they go down the street to like some big box store to Walmart. And they're like, oh, let me just I'm like, can't there. I wish there was another way to like support like local businesses on like the larger front. I would look at that a little, not completely differently because I hear what you're saying. But let's remember how many people at one Walmart employees yeah. I mean, it is a sense of community, and I think you can spread it, right? Like, if I want the the least expensive possible good or service, like, I'm going to use merchants like that. But if it's something that I'm placing a lot of value on, like a gift for my mom for her birthday, like, I want to go to a small family-owned store because I get to tell a story to my mom about how I bought something random from some small business owner. And I think it's us as humans just trying to create that connection with people and realizing that the big box stores play a role, right? They save us money as as a society. There are opportunities for us to buy consumable goods that we just don't want to haggle about price on. But there are things, there are other points of value, I think, that we can attach to shopping local that today, I don't know that everybody is thinking about the way that you guys yeah. are. And Cassie, you brought that up to you, another woman that we're good friends with. She said that as well, too. Like you go into Target, you're supporting those employees that yeah. live in our community in Target. And then back in the day when I worked at Hellsburg Diamonds for during college and everything, I'd have I'd go out in the community and let people know where I work. And like, oh, well, I go to Perry's because it's a local company. And I'm thinking in the back of my head. I live in your community and your purchase would be going towards my commission. But like, yeah. and so, yeah, yeah. I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. I think there's a couple of different ways to look at it. I just love to see the love and I see those people that get to have jobs that might otherwise not. See, first off, I'm, I'm not against target or Walmart. <laughs> right. We didn't I, say you were Chris. I, I am the, <laughs> we weren't picking I, on you. I am the stick that is used to poke bears. Yeah, so I, I will say I love I'm that. Looking. That's a great role. We have a co-founder like that. He <laughs> like he likes to get the stick and poke us. It's perfect though, because in the tension comes the good learnings, yes. right? I, That's I, why I love Chris on the podcast too. <laughs> he comes on many different reasons, but the three main reasons why I love Chris is one: anytime someone says I love listening to your podcast, it's hilarious. It's because Chris. <laughs> Two, he's willing to think beyond the conversation because usually I'm the one who brings the the person on. And then I already know what you do. I already kind of done the background research. Chris doesn't because I tell him not to part of the time. And then um, he also comes in. It's like, okay, well, I don't know anything. Let's start from the ground up because that's where our listeners are coming from. 
in two as the, the stick that pokes the bear. That's so, so. smart to structure it that way. I yeah. like it. Yeah. That's amazing. We're going back to like the preface of the conversation that we started. I just th- think it was very intriguing where you were like, you know, things just get brought into your life at certain points. And I, I feel like a lot of people should, you know, open their, their mind's eye a little bit more to just realize like certain things get brought into your life mm-hmm. for a reason. Cause like we brought on people a while ago who were talking about opening breweries and starting us with whiskey. And I was like, you know, I love this concept. Let's keep going with it. And you're on here talking about like connecting like end to end using Salesforce and it's always funny because I joke with my wife all the time. I'm like, you know, one of these days I'll leave and start my own brewery. And it, hey, we'll be able to help you I was going to say, I know, I was I like, know someone. <laughs> like, one of these days when I find the capital, I will open a, up a brewery. Well, but, and that's it. Capital is hard to get. Yes. And, and, and this industry especially, and especially right now, and I'm not saying any of that to scare you. I'm saying that to say you got to have your ducks in a row. Like you have to have your numbers and you have to, you know, down to the, down to the ounce, you need to know how much of it you need to sell. And until now you didn't have a tool to start to put that stuff together, to be able to keep track of all your prospects and, oh, Laura called me last week and I need to introduce her to my beer next week when with this new beer drops. Yeah. And that is that relationship management stuff, right? It's just having a place to put everything and then making it actionable and, we, we talk a lot to providers of capital. I'm a banker, so yes. it's important to me to help people get access to money. There's a button in QuickBooks, and I love QuickBooks for making this button available. But when you really read the fine print of the button, it's 27% interest. Guys, that's not sustainable. Wow. <clears throat> that's <clears throat> not a sustainable business model. You can't pay that kind of interest. That's like a loan shark. hmm And I'm not knocking them because, again, there are some people that don't have other options. But if you have other options, don't be lazy and hit the button. Like, use your other options because it matters, right? Like, access to capital matters. And with that being said, too, in the industry that I'm in, there's a lot of other options out there. Some of them might need a little bit more legwork. But let me tell you, that legwork certainly pays off as opposed to hitting that button for 27%. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's painful. Nobody likes to go air your dirty laundry and, Mm -hmm. and, and don't wait to get capital until you need it. Like start thinking about how you're going to get capital and plan to have your story match. That's what we're doing. Like I want our KPIs to be amazing. I didn't even Mm -hmm. set an upper floor on it. I just said, just amaze me. (laughs) <laughs> so we did things like average, like good, better, best model, best, best model, furnishings, commercial square footage, KPI, 25 to 35 a square foot, okay. 50 to $70,000 on a 2,000 square foot office building. We did it for $7.61. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, it's perfect. Yeah. It's exactly what we need. We need chairs. We need desks. Every once in a while, we want to stand up. Mm-hmm. We want conference tables where we can commune together and we want couches because I don't love sitting at a desk all the time. $7.61 a square foot. Wow. That's incredible. (laughs) It's amazing. (laughs) Talking about going back to capital real quick, because kind of what you said too about like airing dirty laundry and stuff is that's one of the best opportunities that you can take is taking a weakness that you have when you're going out raising capital is to bring up those things, especially when you find the right investor. Yes. Because investor wants an ROI, return on investment. So when that investor sits down and says, oh, you have this issue and I can give you this and I know I can fix that issue and now you're going to be making that, I can make this off of it. So when he, that investor can monetize that ROI in his head while he's sitting down at that desk with you, that's incredible. So anyone listening that needs help and is afraid to talk about weaknesses, don't because that could be one of the biggest sales points to getting more capital in your business. Amen. Amen. I, I think about all the time, all of the little checkpoints. I said this recently on a podcast, like I feel like we have 2000 checkboxes in our head of things that we need to accomplish before I'm ready to go ask for capital. Guys, I was a banker. I'm conservative. Mm -hmm. These are my friends and family. And I want people that believe in us to be able to invest in us because they believe in us. And that's magic, right? When people believe in you. So we've we've been through I don't know we're 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 near in 1900 I think at this point in my head and I'm so excited about the opportunity to be able to bring this to our friends and family and people that believe in us in the local community that can add value because that adding value part is sometimes mm-hmm. something that 
especially software companies miss, right? Like yeah. money's hard to get. If you can get it, you take it. But why? I mean, sitting on cash on a balance sheet just feels like a terrible mm-hmm. idea to me. And that brings us so much pressure as founders and co-founders to use the cash. And that sometimes gets irrational. Like you yeah. don't furnish your square footage for $7.61 a yeah. square foot, <laughs> even though you can. You don't do mm-hmm. it because you got to get the cash off your balance sheet. Otherwise, you look kind of dumb. Right. The bank doesn't pay very much on that. Yeah, I think having relationships with your investors is so important. And, and that's why we're choosing first to go to people who know us or people who know those who know us because... We want people that can help us and that will link arms with us and are in this for the long term and don't want us to do anything unnatural to satisfy that ROI. Or, right. you know, if it's not natural, let's let's keep ourselves in a point where we don't have to do that. I've been I've seen companies do that and it generally makes it very difficult to rebound from. Yeah. One of the things that I've noticed too, and I've done it in different aspects, is just chasing the dollar and not chasing the prospect. Yes. And You'll just take anyone and everyone, especially the beginning days. You just want to be able to have that that inflow of money. And sometimes you need to do it. So like, I'm not knocking by any means. But when you get to the point where you can actually choose the perfect client for you and create the actual relationship, how much quicker that is to scale. Because when you're going back to before, what one of my professors said is creating those apostles for you. And you're only going to get an apostle if you have a relationship. Yes. Absolutely. That's why feedback is so important to us. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's why we openly solicit it and we, you know, we'll, we'll call customers and check in with them. Customer success. It was our number one employee. The first person we hired, Mackenzie Finn, yeah. customer success manager is employee number one because it will always be that important to us. We hired that before we had a customer because we yeah. knew that without that program, to be able to support these folks and give them the service that they deserve. They deserve it because they're doing so much amazing stuff. And it is hard mm-hmm. without technology to support it. So, yeah, customers, your customers are your lifeblood. I hope some of our customers will be able to invest in us. I think yeah. who better to, to get to profit from our tremendous growth, which exactly. is already happening, yeah. than our customers. So, yeah, we're optimistic. So we've added a new question to the podcast. And it's kind of going through the theme because we're, we've been building up to it this whole time. What does success look like to you? <laughs> I giggle because I don't know. You know, when I first started this, I thought maybe I'm supposed to ring a bell. But it's hard. It's hard to ring a bell and scale love. And and that's really what I'm. everything I've been talking about today has been about how do we help our customers see that we have their best intentions at heart, that we are passionate about what they do? And we've built so much process and we've built so much technology to support our process, which then ultimately we hand over to our customers because they have people too, right? Mm-hmm. So when I think about that, I think our success is that we build this amazing, sustainable company that is full of love. And and what what does love look like in a company? It looks like a, to inspire each other and who clap for each other, even when your dog tired and who stand along in a line. It's so funny. You can walk into Ohana on a Monday morning and it's like, it's like the soul train line. People are just <laughs> walking to their desk and it's so exciting to be there and to be passionate about what we're doing and to have this positive outlook and to have customers telling us every day that we're changing the way they do business for the better. I mean, it's just magical. So my ultimate goal is to scale that as much as we can scale it without breaking it. And I think we can scale it to the moon. So we'll see what happens. That's great. And our last question, since we're running up on an hour now already, is if you could tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? Believe in yourself. I didn't even hesitate before I said that because I have not done so many things for fear of failure. Believe in yourself, and when you have weaknesses, fix them. Go go read a book or listen to a podcast or do something to inspire yourself when there is inspiration coming from no other source because you're your greatest source of inspiration. So believe in yourself and trust your gut and, and just follow your dreams and dream big because it's possible. Anything can happen. That's awesome. I love that. That was just real quick before we wrap it up with Chris is – when I first got in sales, that was one of my big, biggest weaknesses is being able to get in front of someone and to sell them something. 
And so when I was in college, I was like, I have nothing else to lose. Like, let me go find somewhere that's commission based where I only make money if I, I sell that. something. So that's that. how I started in jewelry and then made a 10 year career out of it. Feast or famine. But there's something out of that that just forces you to lay down your mm-hmm. fears. I love that. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's a great idea. I never was brave enough to do that. I never took a straight commission job because I thought, oh, what if I don't have a W-2? Yeah, right. <laughs> There was a book I read in high school. It was called Four Hour Work Week with Tim Ferriss. And it was all about, other than just automation, but the other part that I took a lot out of was just facing your fears head on and walk straight into it. Yeah, it's amazing. So, real question this evening. Okay. I never know anymore. <laughs> it's so dark sometimes. I'm like, I don't know what time of day it is. Um, are you guys on social media? How can people like reach out or find you guys to kind of help grow you? Ohanify. That is amazing. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, I should do more of that promotion stuff. It's We have a website, www.ohanify.com. Ohana, loosely translated to make or create family, O-H-A-N-A-F-Y. We also are on LinkedIn and Instagram, and I think we have a TikTok coming. And hmm. we're considering the security ramifications and all the fear, but honestly, it's just fun. Like, yeah. can we just yeah. go on there and be silly sometimes? Because... People need to see our hearts, you know? Yeah. So I think we might buck the system on that one and do it, even though a lot of people are afraid of it right now, because it's just fun to get to see who we are. Y'all need to see me break dancing exactly. on a Friday <laughs> afternoon at 3 p.m. or something crazy, you know? I definitely think there should be a Lilo and Stitch thing in there with Ohana. <laughs> yes. Ohana means family. Of course it does. <laughs> of course. But that company name existed before I showed up, so that makes That's it amazing. even more special. I yeah. love it. Well, I just want to say thank you for coming on. Thank I you. Like we were saying earlier, like certain things are dropped into your path or kind of put on your map throughout your life. And I feel like this is kind of one of those things, which is very helpful. But I just want to say thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode. I feel like I learned a lot. If you didn't, well, you should probably listen, listen to this again. again. And rate us on Spotify. Five stars is amazing. But thank you, everyone. And cheers. Cheers. Cheers.